All right, fans, welcome to the inaugural episode of the Sunday Morning Corner Man, available exclusively at Combat Press. I am your host, John Franklin. This week, I am very fortunate to be joined by the head coach over at Grudge MMA in Denver, Colorado, Trevor Whitman. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great. I appreciate you having me on the show. Absolutely. Um, so, I want to start uh, with Rose uh, Nama Yunus, who fought Paige Van Zant the other night. Looked fantastic. Um, I want to get a little bit of history with you and Rose because I know that she was with uh, the Rufus guys for a while, and then I think that's when she was on Tough. So at what point did she come to Grudge? Actually, she's been with me uh, all the way since uh, Tisha Torres' fight. That was our first fight together. Okay, and um, so, uh, good. So, so it was a little bit before the show, and that's when I was training Pat. I met Pat on the Ultimate Fighter uh, season I believe 16 or 17 with Shane Carr when I met Pat, and Pat introduced me to Rose, and uh, we've been working together pretty much ever since. All right, and, and, and specifically in talking about the fight, I, I want to know just what, what did you guys think about Paige Van Zant uh, coming into the fight? Like, how did you how did you have her scouted out? Uh, you know, I, I thought, uh, you know, pretty much our whole team, you know, watched tape and, and believed she was good in every in area, but wasn't spectacular in any area. So... One of our main game plans was to, to really just keep her at bay, but also rough her up in the clinch. We wanted to do lots of dirty boxing, but then uh, Rose really felt her strength with the uh, easy takedown. So we kind of just, you know, changed momentum with that. I, I mean, I'm a big believer that if someone has something good, try to try to let them know that you can beat them in that area because it, it pulls confidence from them. And I felt like Rose went out there and did a good job on uh, really making her look uh, uh, fatigued by mentally you know, fatiguing there. So it was, uh, it, the, the game plan really went well. All right, yeah, so I, I would imagine you'd have to deviate much from it. So give me a little bit of an idea of, of who Rose is with a mental makeup because it seems like when you're fighting someone like Paige Van Zandt with a lot of hype behind her, some people could get caught up in that. Some people get tired of, you know, getting asked questions about being a stepping stone. But Rose seems pretty even-keeled when it comes to stuff like that. Am I, am I reading her correctly? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... I mean, she's definitely got the emotions going in. Uh, uh, any any time that you have a fighter that 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 fears the outcome, it, it, that means they're they're really focused on the fight. If they don't fear the outcome or they're not really stressed about the fight, to me, that's a that's kind of a uh, a sign of of nothing. If something's not going right, you know, someone you know, if your your athlete might be overlooking the fight. But uh, Rose goes into the fight uh, uh, very nervous, and for me, the the most nerv- uh, the less nervous she was. It was the color part of the fight. She didn't seem too nervous for that fight. And that one, uh, we went out there and pushed the pace a little too hard. And uh, I really feel like it was the coach's uh, uh, reasoning for that failure. Because uh, we went into that fight thinking it was going to be somewhat easy. We didn't really you know, go too much into detail. Even though we were training for five rounds, we weren't keeping that and planting that seed in her head. So she went out there and hit that pace coming off the ultimate fighter going two rounds, you know, a two-round fight. I really feel the coaches could have did a better job in, in really planting those seeds and letting her know it's going to be a five-round fight. But that's the, the best best thing about going out there and having, you know, a loss because it really it puts you on track to go out there and, 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 you know, know that can happen. And we've done a lot of studying and really putting into rows on where it's going to tighten her areas up. It's really not a technical thing because she's so damn technical. She learns so damn fast. But it's really keeping her mind right going into the fight is the key point to getting her to succeed. And the interesting thing, if I remember correctly, about that was it seemed like Carla was sort of running through things in the in the uh, in the Ultimate Fighter, and then right before the fight, everything sort of switched over to Rose, where everybody thought that she was kind of the favorite, and we're super impressed with her. So I can understand where maybe the emotions would be like you go from women you're the oh, underdog yeah. to everybody starting to think you're the you know you're the favorite. That kind of flips things. So um, it, yeah, it's it's, uh, it, it's it's a disadvantage because you you start to get overconfident in what you're doing. And like I said, that was. To me, I take 100% fault in that being a part of the coaching staff and, uh, and allowing that to happen. So we had to make an adjustment, and uh, now going out and seeing her with her with her nerves before the fight. I mean, that's that's when fighters perform at their best. I remember when George St. Pierre used to always get so so damn nervous before fighting. I mean, he'd express it to everybody. And uh, Rose has that similarity where she she just gets so nervous, but she comes out so composed and ready, and she's aware. Awareness is key to, to performing. That's interesting. I was going to actually bring up GSP because he, he, he says fear motivates everything with him. I want to talk a little bit about your emotions because I saw you in the cage yep. after the fight. And you, I mean, listen, you're a guy with an easy smile. 
Um, and that's yeah. one of the great things about you. But you seem really, really excited after this fight. What what kind of emotions go through your mind leading up to a fight and then after the fight's over? And, and what, what brought you to those emotions in the cage? Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, going into these fights like this. I mean, it's, I get the best seat in the house, and uh, I'm so excited. You know, as, as you see me walking out, I'm excited. Man. I'm, I'm, I'm happy, and I, and I have the belief in my athletes. Because uh, if we're doing everything right in the gym, I really, really believe we're going to go out there and, and do what we need to do. And uh, and then after the fight, it was just so exciting to see her go five rounds and then get the finish in the fifth round. I was so excited about that because, you know, a fighter, after they're finished and they felt so fatigued in their first time having a main event with Carla and then it's supposed to be a five-round fight, and then getting to that point where she had that, that, that somewhat of the panic breathing and uh, the tenseness, it was really cool to see her compose herself and push the pace the whole fight. And to me, that's just an exciting thing. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's very similar to like when Shane Carwin fought Brock Lesnar. You know, he feared his conditioning after a period. Everybody tell him, can you even go five rounds? And then you could see in the, in the, the next fight with Dos Santos, I mean, he almost got a finish right at the end of the fight and he was, he was walking him down. So it's it. When a fighter starts to fear the conditioning part and fear the, 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 the longevity of a fight, it was just very, very cool for me to, to, to see an athlete go out there and, and push the pace and, and do that type of damage and stay so mentally focused and strong. I mean, I was just, I was just ex- extremely excited, you know. I mean, it's exciting. I mean, you know, there's three fights on the, you know, in the week all in Vegas, and of the storylines, your fight arose is one of, the, one of the three or four main ones, you know, because yeah. of how great she performs. That's got to be exciting. So what do you it think is, is uh, yeah, what do you think's next for Rose if you had your way? You know, it's, uh, it, I'm really up for the challenge. Like, it's, uh, we were talking a little bit about the, the, the Justin Gaethje fight. We didn't get to do that interview that night. But, uh, you know, going into the tournament, like, for getting Justin Gaethje, there's so many guys involved. I, I really want to, I want to fight who's ever in front of us. You know, and Rose, Rose has the, the abilities to pretty much do anything. It's, again, it's all about that mind, so it's up to the coaches and Keep her sharp. So for me, anybody that can throw that up, I'm okay with. You know, as long as we're not a sport, I really feel like if we can go out there and try to try that, uh, Rose is the best in the division, especially when she's, when she's mentally. All right, I want to I go ahead and spin things forward, and we'll talk about the next night with Frankie Edgar. I want to get your thoughts on that fight. So, I mean, it was a quick fight. Frankie came out and knocked out Chad Mendez. Yep. What did you. What did you see? Let's talk technique-wise. Do you think that, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about Connor and Jose in a second uh, about how that went down, but do you think that it was, a, it was a lapse in technique on Chad's part? Do you think it was just, hey, everybody gets caught? What did you see in that fight? Well, it's, uh, I mean, Frankie, Frankie is a really good boxer, and he's got really good footwork, and, he's, and, he, and he puts, you know, different variations of combos together, working with Mark Henry. Mark Henry is a great, great coach. And, uh, you could just see it with his footwork. He comes in and he kind of level changes and throws that body shot. He goes to, he goes to the left hand of the body and then left hand of the hook. And almost any time on a defensive standpoint, if I'm, if I get hit with a body shot, naturally my elbow is going to pull back right to where I was just hit because body shots they just <laughs> they make you react that way. So you could see Chaz Mendez's uh, right elbow comes back to his body, exposing the left hook, and it was just a clean, just barely, barely touch him. And those are the shots that, that turned the head and kind of cut off the, the, the jugulars. And uh, I, I just thought it was a great combination, and it was great footwork coming in. Frankie's got some of the best footwork in the game. Uh, you know, he's, he's very fast in and out, and uh, he really knows how to fight his type of a fight. And I thought that, that really is a credit to Mark Henry. Mark Henry's a great, great coach, been with Frankie for so long. And it's just great to see. And then, you know, he's always been Frankie has that, that ground attack to follow, but his boxing is one of a kind. It's great to watch. It's a pleasure. Yeah, and I want to I want to talk, and I, w- I really want to talk about putting putting uh, uh, some perspective on who Frankie is here in a second. Before that, let's talk about Chad Mendez from a coach's perspective. How do you handle? I mean, he's got three losses in a row, but they're not really high level guys. So how do you you know yeah. former champ, a champ, and now you know Frankie may be the next champ. So how do you handle a loss? Talk to me about the next couple days after a loss like that in dealing with your fighter. Oh, it's tough. I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's hard to lose when you're a winner, and you know Chad Mendez is, is, is a winner, and, and, and it's very, it's been very consistent in the winning column outside of these last three fights. So, you know, that's a, that's a hard thing to deal with. You know, it's, uh, 
you just got to kind of stay away from the public eye and don't listen to the judgments of what everybody else is making because you are fighting at the highest level of the game. And when you're out there, I mean, one punch can change the fight just like it did in the Frankie Edgar fight. You know, don't take nothing away from Frankie, but, I mean, a punch will change a fight instantly, and especially the first round, you know. So they didn't get to really get their momentum going and get that flow going. I would just, you know, kind of as, as, uh, as, as a part of the team, if I was a part of the team, I'd probably want to take a step back and, uh, you know, maybe get one or two stepping stone type of opponents to get the confidence back and get the flow back uh, so he can make another title run because he's got the ability. Yeah, it's kind of like, I mean, it's funny they kind of had a back and forth a couple of months ago, but it's kind of like Chael. I mean, you get there and you just, you're not, you can't be the guy, but you're right there. So you don't want, yeah. him, to, you don't want him to fight like, you know, the seven, eight, nine guys at the division, but. If he beats, you don't want him also derailing anybody's title hopes because he can't seem to get over that hump. I want to talk about Frankie yeah, from this. Yeah. I want to talk about Frankie from this perspective, because I think that he's a coach's fighter or like a fighter's fighter in the sense that I think Frankie is almost a little bit more evolved than the than the casual fan can understand. And someday we're going to mm-hmm. look back at this guy and say, "Wow, he was one of the best fighters ever to fight in the UFC." We just didn't know what we, what we were seeing yet. And a lot of the fans yeah. don't get how great Frank Yeager is. Do, do you do you see that? And and, and I mean, oh, yeah. is he somebody I mean, that Frank, we're going to look back on differently? Frank is a guy who comes from the 155. I mean, he was at the top of the. the I mean, cha- I believe he was a champion at the 55 division. I mean, I uh, I, I can't 100 percent quote that, but I believe he was at 155. Yeah, he was. And then going down to 145. I mean, he's 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 been in the game for so damn long. I mean, he's beat like there's so many great great fighters. And he's so consistent, I mean, and, and, and it's, it's not just in one area; it's in all parts of his game. I mean, he is—he is one of the do- most dominant guys out there when he fights. So I think uh, Frankie is just getting better and better and better. And uh, again, it's from his consistency and and how he's always wanting to go out there. And the cool thing I like about Frankie too, and I don't think that a lot of people see that in him, uh, uh, because he's not your typical, you know, Jersey. Italian, you know, he brings a lot of attention to him. You know, he's not the guy. He's a very humble guy. He's, he's very uh, soft-spoken. So, you know, sometimes when you're that soft-spoken guy, you don't get a lot of fan base following you. But uh, when it comes to the technical aspect of fighting, I mean, he is he is, he is the top of the game. He's, he's a pleasure to watch. Yeah, I think that he, he – the interesting thing to me about Frankie is that he uses – one of the most impressive performances in the history of the UFC to me was when Randy Couture fought Tim Sylvia. And the reason why mm-hmm. that was so impressive to me was he used the fact that he was a smaller guy as an excuse. Mm-hmm. Like, he level changed and moved his head. And the knock on MMA, and you could probably speak more intelligently about this to me, but the knock on MMA boxers is that they don't move their head enough. And um, yeah. not everybody, but a lot. And I yeah. thought that that's what Frankie does. Frankie's good at using yeah. his boxing to transition into his wrestling and vice versa. So oh, yeah. I think that's the genius of him that won't be understood until he's out of the game. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the one thing that, that Mark Henry does really good. He, he focuses on position, then defense, and then offense. I mean, an offense is very natural for Frankie because he's an aggressive guy. But if you can keep the guy in the right position to keep keep his balance and defend him and not take advantage, I mean, that's, that's what keeps the fighter's uh, a longevity going and also keeps the fighter growing where they can continue to be, get better. They don't get that flat line when they're taking too much damage and too many years in inside the, the cage. And uh, then you'll see that the, the athletic tendencies and the, the, the youth of a fighter start to go downhill. Absolutely. All right, let's spin it forward to uh, to last night. Luke Rockhold uh, took the belt from Chris Weidman. He uh, won the decision. So, uh, or no, he finished him. So my question yeah. uh, to you, and we talked about this a little bit, so I'll just kind of glaze over this. The emotions leading up to the fight, Rockhold seemed super focused. Weidman seemed a little laid back. Do you think that's that's the job of the coach to say, listen, bud, you got to get a little more focused here, or you need to chill out? I mean, are you the one who who tries to get a temperature of your fighter and say, you know, like you said with Rose, this is the this is the emotions you carry when you're successful. Yeah, I mean, you you have to do that as a coach. You know, it's uh, it's it's a tough thing to do because you 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 play these, and this just comes from more experience and more experience and more experience with the coach and the fighter together. Because I've had times where it's worked opposite, you know, where you're like, oh my gosh, it's too quiet right now. So you're always assessing these areas. But if you haven't went through that tough loss before, you really can't assess it. You know, so you don't know. You don't know if it's that that, that momentum of just you know, it's like Conor McGregor. We'll talk a little bit about it, I'm guessing here shortly. But uh, Conor McGregor's head game of being confident and overconfident on the scene is such a benefit to him. You know, sometimes it's a, it's a default to, to, to some people that that overconfidence will, will hurt you. And that really just depends on the athlete because everybody's minds are different. 
you know, every, how, how everybody uses momentum to create their, their success is different. So that's kind of something that you, I can't really pick it up and say, oh, I, I don't think that's, that's what caused this in this fight. But it's something to assess and say, that was he not going with this fight, right? Because both, both were starting to get very fatigued. And they were both putting on a real, real tough fight. So, you know, going later into the fight, I mean, it would, it would have been just rough and rough and rough. But it's hard to say, you know, I don't know the athletes and I can't really, you know, judge what was going on the week of the fight. Especially when you see in the cameras around, who knows if it's real, who knows if it's fake, you know? Right. A lot of times people will build, build stuff up as they're around the camera crew. So I really can't assess that, that area of it. I just thought it was an awesome fight. And Absolutely. I really felt like it, it was, I felt like uh, Weidman was coming back and coming back strong, and I felt like uh, Rockhold was, was starting to go downhill a little bit, to be honest with you, until Weidman made that mistake. You know, and this is this is where the sport is so, so demanding. At the highest level, you cannot afford to make mistakes against world-class athletes. Because you can make mistakes against the mid-level guys, but if you make one mistake against someone who, who can really find an opportunity, uh, it, it could really hurt you. And I felt like Weidman, you know, tried to spin kick and he was off balance and uh, did it at the wrong time. The timing wasn't right. It wasn't set up. And I felt like he made that mistake and gave an opportunity to uh, Luke Rockhold, who went out there and took advantage of it. And, and I'll ask you, it's, it's perfect uh, segue to what was going to be my next question anyway. So do you think that the wheel kick really was the mistake that led oh, to yeah. well do you think it's what oh, led to totally. it or do you think it was inevitable that Luke Rockhold was just more apt to win No, that fight? I actually thought Weidman was coming back. I thought Weidman's body kicks were being super effective. You know, Rockhold started off with the body kicks and uh, throwing those hard, hard body kicks and super effective. You know, those are the ones that will really start wearing you down. And uh, Weidman started returning the kicks again. I felt once once Weidman started bringing the body kicks back, he started bringing back a little bit of momentum and it, it, it kind of seemed to me like the the tide could shift right there. I seen Rockhold taking just some deep breaths, and uh, and then you know that spin kick came out, and uh, and then and then Luke got on top and just you know mounted him and, and stayed very. You know one thing is when it comes to to the mount, I think it's one of the one of the positions that I'm not a super fan of unless you know the mount because it's it, to me I see a lot of people that escape from from that position and the way Luke Rockhold just stayed heavy on the hips and. And, and kept his, his, his low posture in one post where he's able to still short elbows where he's not popping up too tall and long and the buck. I thought that was awesome. Outside of, I thought, I did think the fight went on a little too long. I, took, uh, I think uh, Luke took too much damage at the end of that round. I really felt like that fight should have been stopped. Yeah. And now, do you think that, that um, and, and we'll talk about this, obviously, with the Connor Jose, Jose fight in a second. Do you think that Luke... Uh, that Chris Weidman should ask for an immediate rematch? Do you think that Luke's going to have a long reign? Like, how do you see the, that 185-pound division with Luke Rockhold at the top? Do you think that Chris Weidman cleans that one thing up and he could grab that belt back, or do you think Luke's in for a long reign? You know, I'm never a fan of instant rematches. I'm just not. You, you know, know it's, uh, it's, it, 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 to, to me, it's, it's, it's great for the, for the people who are creating the money behind it and the hype behind it, but to the people who really care about the sport, I mean, you got to work your way up and... Uh, you know, I don't care if it's the one fight after. If someone goes out there and has a great performance or a back in the title to pitch, I mean, to hold your ranking. But give someone else an opportunity who's out there because, this, you know, when it comes to MMA, it's very hard to keep that consistency. It's hard to go just, just consistent without losing, losing, losing. I mean, this game, there's so many different things that come into it. You know, and uh, these guys that sit waiting in the number two, number three positions for too long, they, they you know, I mean, one little mistake can stick you back and then you don't ever even get a chance to fight for the title. I, I think it hurts those guys who are who are could, you know could be next in line. And you know, do I think it's a good thing if he does come back for a rematch? I think it'll be an even fight again. I think it was a great fight, and I, I I really don't think one person dominated that fight. I think if there's different times, it could have went either way. You know, so I think it's a very great matchup again. You know, so I, uh, it'd be a fun fight to watch. I don't think like anybody just really looked super over dominant. I, again, I think it was from someone you know, taking a chance, and uh, it hurt him more than helped him. Absolutely. No, I agree. And what ends up happening sometimes is, you know, you have these guys who are evenly matched. The, the one guy wins the first fight, the other guy wins the second fight. Now you've tied a division up for a yeah. year and change. Yeah. You know, you got Junior yeah. Dos Santos, so. and there's an injury in there. This division gets tied up forever. So uh, that's yeah. why, if you're a guy, I was praying to God that, that uh, Palomino didn't win that tournament. Because, you know, it's like, I'm yeah. sure Justin was. And I'm sure even yeah. with the second fight, Absolutely. they're great fights. You can't argue with them being great fights but it's like you know justin 
uh, beats a guy, he deserves a new challenger, in my opinion. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's another payday. And whether, whether you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and try to predict things, whether, you know, Justin wins the third fight or not. You know, it's just, it's not a new experience for us. I want right. to see different styles. And as a coach, you know, I want my fighter to grow. Because the one thing is, is once you get to that, 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 that high end, that 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 money train is what I call it. When you're when you're a world champion and people respect you as a world champion, you've got to be able to to, to hold that ride. And and Justin Gaethje is still very young in the game, so when it comes to those, those experiences, we don't want to fight the same guys over and over. It just makes no sense to us. I, I want to take before we get to the Conor Jose fight. I want to take just kind of a diversion because I was going to ask you this earlier, and I just want to get your, your thoughts on this. What do you think in terms of head coaches? Uh, because a lot of times you'll transition in different camps. Do you think the difference between being the head coach, the main coach for a fighter, and being just a skill set coach is the handling of the emotions and all that sort of stuff? Oh, yeah. The, the head coach, that's the most important part of the head coach position. It's, there's there's no difference. in like, like a head coach shouldn't be like a guy like, oh, man, I, I, I know every move in the game. I do not at all. The coach is the one that controls the team, who, who schedules uh, uh, the training, who – keeps everybody on the same page, makes sure that all the coaches are on the same page. So one coach isn't pushing one, you know, if you have three practices in one day and not all the coaches, because all the coaches, you go into a training camp, everybody's excited. So everybody's going to go, all right, two hours of workout today, as hard as we can go. You know, the head coach has got to be able to gather all that together and keep everybody in control and then on, on, the, on the right process, uh, that everybody's working together. And that comes into the week of the fight. That comes into the corner. So it's, it's really knowing where the fighter's at and that's the, the head coach is the person that needs to know that fighter more than anybody when it comes to their emotion. How do they react? How do you piss them off? How do you cool them down? And uh, really know the emotional status of the fighter and then also the emotional status of every coach that is involved. And that's interesting because I heard once uh, said about football, they said the difference between a position coach and a head coach is a head coach coaches coaches and a position mm -hmm. coach coaches players. And that's kind of similar, similar to what you're saying. You've got you to see the v whole Very picture. similar. Right. Very right. similar. It's, it's keeping everybody working on the same page because there's a lot of a lot of, a lot of uh, pride going into, into stuff like that. And the the whole most important part when it comes to a to head coach and a coaching staff is it's all got to come back to the fighters. It's all about the fighters. It's about no, you know, a lot of times people will get involved and they're like, oh, it's me, me, me. No, it's it's, it's always about a fighter. And if you can keep that momentum, that's uh, it's it's that's a key point to success as an athlete. Sounds good. Let's move on to the Conor Jose fight. Um, obviously, everybody on every piece of land in the world knows how this thing ended. So what I'll ask you is I'll use the Conor fight just sort of as a way to ask this question. What was Vegas like this week with three high-profile cards in the span of three days? I mean, was it different than it normally is? Uh, you know, it kind of reminded me of uh, uh, having the fight during the expo is what yeah. it kind of reminded me. You know, right outside of there was a... There were, there were a lot of Irish fans, you know. It, uh, it was cool. It was, it was really, really cool. It was an exciting moment. And uh, I'll tell you what, the Irish fans are super respectful. They, we, we were getting stopped all the time by them, and, man, they were just, they were just a pleasure. Every, every one of them, they, they – <laughs> I didn't get one uh, – you know, almost every one of them was drunk while talking to them, but they all were very composed drunk. They weren't, uh, you know, the shit talkers and uh, the people that bring up uh, crazy stuff. Sometimes the different areas of, of the game, you'll get those type of guys, and those guys there will kind of annoy you, you know. But uh, I'll tell you, their 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 fan base is awesome. All right, let's, I want I want to take you back just to the headspace you were in. How did you see this fight between Connor and Jose coming in? Because a lot of people you know, were, uh, were different. You, you, I haven't really watched uh, a bunch of Connor. I seen the last Chad Mendes fight. I've seen one other fight before that. I didn't. I haven't seen a lot of him. I'll think, I'll tell you the one thing that stands out more than anything is his is, is, is his mindset. And to me, that's uh, again a, a super important thing because the mind is just as important as, as as a physical. And he's a guy who, you know, you almost could call it tricking yourself into believing and. You know, when it comes to a technical uh, standpoint, I mean, the guy is so damn technical. He's, he's a pleasure to watch. He's a sharpshooter. He's, he's balanced. He's, he's, he's very well-rounded uh, from what I've seen so far. But when it comes to his mental state, he's a guy who almost forces himself into these positions and then keeps the momentum with the top going. And uh, you can really, really uh, uh, produce a lot of momentum off that. A lot of people will break and put themselves in situations, but he's a guy that I think it helps him and benefits him with what he does. I mean, he just, he's, 
it's almost like affirmations. When you use an affirmation over and over and over, you say it a hundred, you know, a hundred times, two hundred times, you really start to believe it, even if you didn't believe it before you started saying it. You know, it's uh, uh, to me that's where his strong point is, and that's that's the part that stands out the most to me is his his, his, his game, his mental mental aspect. And and honestly, it's 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 sort of a worn out cliche in MMA, but it's true. I mean, Connor uh, in the mental game will take you into deep water because he can do backstrokes in deep water. You know, oh, mental yeah. wise, he doesn't care how big the yeah. scene is. He doesn't care. That's where he lives. So he's like, okay, yeah. I'm gonna get you to press. I'm gonna get you nervous. I'm gonna get you not wanting yeah. me to embarrass you. And now you're just yeah. a whole different guy. So uh, yeah, completely. So here's my question: How surprised were you that Connor found that opening? Not when he found it, because everybody was surprised when he found it. But were you surprised that he you could know, find that uh, opening? Uh, again, it's. Uh, being a sharpshooter, you're, you're a guy who, like, he's timing motion. He's timing the first step. He's timing the first thing that's coming at him. And what he did, like, he was shifting his body in and out, almost like he's fish. You know, you use a worm and you pull it in a little bit, let it go. Pull it in a little bit, let it go. And uh, he does that body that's shifting forward and back with his body. And uh, he was really, you know, starting to lure him in. He throws that little that little uh, uh, side of the knee kick and pitch you off a little bit. And then you wait for it. And what he did is he just sat back and waited, and I really felt like uh, Aldo made a big mistake by lunging in with a with a you know a lunging left hook. That's a power shot without working. You know, you, you when you lunge, when you throw a right hand and you kind of set your feet, you, it's like a squat hop off of both legs. That that lunging lead hook that comes after that cast. To me, that's like you're opening your wings like a bird. You're exposing your chin. So much, and I felt like it was the leverage that Alba was bringing into the punch is what created that knockout. Okay, now you do know, you think he, also he had his shoulders and head in front of his feet, which is a great shot. Like I love, I love lunging hooks, but I think of lunging hooks is like finishing shots, like when someone's rocking, they're falling away from you. Right. You just feel Mike Mike Tyson do it in Holyfield, where they lunge at you once you rock, you know, and as you're leaving. But uh, uh, Connor was set to punch, and you never want to lunge at someone that's when they're ready to kind of to. to uh, counter, yeah. You know, I don't want to the counter fighter, you know. So do you think, so in, in, in saying that, do you think that there was anything behind Jose's left? And the reason why I ask is because, does the, or uh, does that mean, because one of the things that I was telling people around me when that happened was, I was like, yeah, Connor knocked Jose out, but another thing you have to keep in mind is he ate the punch that, like Jose's punch landed, and he ate it. Yeah. So does yeah. that give us any kind of an indication? I mean, we, he's known to have a good chin. But I'm just saying, do you yeah, think he's that got a great lets us chin. know yeah. that, okay, here's, like, if you were scouting him, which, which, and we'll get to in a second, would you say, ah, maybe he's got a, maybe, he's, maybe part of the reason where, why he has all this bravado, and a lot of guys that do, Anderson Silva had a great chin late, Chuck Liddell had a great chin, uh, yeah. I mean, early, they all, and it was easier to sort of put yourself in harm's way when you have a great chin, Justin Gaethje has a great chin, it's easier yeah. to get into harm's way when you know that, that there are maybe a handful of guys that can take you out only in the, oh, in, definitely. And, and 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 having a great chin too is also believing uh, uh, in your chin. And what I mean by the belief in it doesn't mean that oh I believe I can take a hard shot and you punch me and I don't get hurt. It's about how you take the shot. And when you're locked and you're 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 you're, you're strong with your neck and strong with your forehead based forward, you're 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 okay with taking a punch. And once you you know you'll see a lot of guys who were known to have great chins that people say their their jaw got you know turned into glass or whatever it is. It's more of a mental state. I feel like when people hesitate and they fear getting hit, they have a tendency of pulling at the last second as a punch comes. That loosens your neck up and uh, you're not braced like you're leaning up against the wall with your head. So you're not locking everything in your neck and your in your upper back and 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 really being able to bite down with the punch. You know, if you if if I'm going to walk. And, and let's say I'm going to walk into my garage door with my head. If I'm loose with my neck, it's, it's a whole different thing compared to knowing that the garage door is there and I'm going to walk with my head based into it, my forehead. You can take a shot so much better when you commit to it. And I feel like Conor McGregor, his confidence in, in, in his mind and, and his push, like, you know, I'll, I'll throw a punch with you any day, is, is the deal there. Like, he, he just caught him coming in over his feet. And uh, he's a good rangy, rangy fighter, but I just I, I feel like he's he's very strong with his uh, with his mindset. That's what really helps him with taking a shot. All right, so let's spin this forward. Obviously, you said you're not a fan of instant rematches, neither am I. Um, do Do you think Jose deserves one? Um, you know, it's uh, if, if there's anybody who's going out there and, and deserving a rematch like this, a lot of people like uh, uh, Joe Rogan said last night. Ah, you don't. I mean, you got to stop the thirteen. Uh, yeah, that was a, definitely a mistake, and maybe he needs to go back to learning block. But one punch, and if you look at 90% of knockouts, they happen in the first round. 
So you're out there, you're dry. I mean, how long you have to wait for the, especially in the main event, you have to wait for the person to get to the ring. And especially the way Jose Aldo was just standing there. There was no motion. There was no keeping the blood rushing. There was, he, he looked cold. He looked, he looked uh, like he, he wasn't warm. Didn't have a good sweat. And most knockouts happen on the first shot that you hit with because you just, you're, you're, you're not into the fight, you know? And, uh, uh, I mean, I would love to see it go on a little bit longer. But, uh, again, all you can do is praise Connor you know, being able to, to expose the, the mistake that was made by Aldo. Absolutely, I agree. And I think, know, one so. of the, yeah, I think one of the things, that, one of the beauties of Connor that really doesn't get talked about that much is that he's sort of ahead of the curve. And what I mean by that is by the time people catch up to him, and I'm not talking about in the cage, I'm talking about out of it as well, he's already gone. So I think that the reason why he's already talking about 55 is because he's like, I don't want Jose Aldo to figure me out. He already didn't. Yeah. So that was his shot. He doesn't get another one. Yeah. It's time for 55. Because the more you sort of scout Connor, maybe you start to find the holes that you can that you can uh, you can expose. That's why I'm, I don't think he's into rematches. I'm sure that he wants to, you know, make that Aldo money again. But if he can find that money at 55, why why waste your time with Aldo? Now that question leads to this one. You have a relationship with Donald Cerrone. He is um, he is uh, fighting for the uh, 155 pound belt. The winner of that fight will likely get. Connor next? Should Connor want to do that? Should the UFC want to do that? If uh, Donald Cerrone would wins that fight, and a lot of people think that he will, how much of his preparation would you be involved in? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, Donald, uh, I used to work with him a lot in the beginning, but now he's got his ranch in New Mexico. It's, uh, you know, he's got a great thing going on. He's got coaches that travel with him. You know, there's sometimes it's good for, for a fighter to go and travel to different camps. Sometimes it's not. Donald Cerrone's got that X Games type of thing. He goes around, he serves, he wakeboards, he does all these different things. And he likes to travel. He likes to keep the, the, the mind at ease, having fun. You know, and uh, so I doubt I'll, I'll do any any work with him with that. Who knows, uh, you know. But uh, with when it comes to a style as, as Donald Cerrone, the, the type of style that I think is going to really, you know, give uh, Conor McGregor issues is, a, a lengthy fighter and there's no one that fights more lengthy than, than Donald and he's very good at running the tech as you go backwards he's not going to try to use a single power shot as a, as a as a setup you know he if he throws any type of a power uh, lead shot it's like a like a counter lead head kick you know he's very good with that lead left high kick but uh, Donald does a good job of kind of throwing his his hands to push you back a little bit where they don't have much on it so he's not exposing his chin and then run low kicks and stuff like that. So I think stylistically it'd be a good fight to see him fight a Conor McGregor because anybody that's going to be a shorter body, I mean, Conor fights so rangy. He's, he's got that wide stance and he's, and he's so damn fast. So I think he gives anybody at 145 uh, issues really, to be honest with you, unless they're able to close the gap and, uh, and get him to the ground. I agree. And just like you said with Donald, I mean, Donald fights very long and he's able yeah. to, and he, and, he, and he strikes at all different levels. So he's bringing a yeah. lot to the table against Connor. I, I agree. I think that'll be. A, I, I would be more interested in seeing that fight than I would uh, Dos Anjos, even though I think Dos Anjos is a good striker, like you said. Donald has that yeah. size, and that, I think that yeah. makes for a more interesting matchup for Connor. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and, and end things here. I want to talk a little bit about Grudge. Um, first off, let's talk about Justin Gaethje, 155 pound champion, World Series of Fighting. Uh, we know who his opponent is going to be. Brian Foster, um, you and I were at that fight, and, and we even talked, and you said it's interesting to sort of be able to scout guys and not have to worry about you know your duties as a coach other than just watching fights and enjoying them. So um, talk a little bit about about the, the like kind of catch me up on the conversation we had that night of how much did you enjoy just being able to watch the fights and scout the guys that are ultimately coming after your guy? Oh man, it was awesome. It was a, it was a great time. I mean, getting there, we had like this this. We were sitting the same height of the cage, looking right in about five feet away. I mean, it was just perfect. And everybody coming in was just uh, was just putting on great fights. So it was, just, it was really, really cool to see. You know, sit back and uh, get a front row seat at scouting. But just uh, just the performances by everybody too. It was really cool. You know, I'm never really a fan of the tournament uh, uh, style format to see who the real best guy is. But uh, man, it was exciting, and uh, it's cool that World Series is, is really building their 155 division because I felt like we kind of wiped it out, and now it's uh, it's really got a fire underneath us and excitement, you know, to go out there and challenge yourself more. So it was really, really fun. All right, talk to me a little bit about the timeline for Brian Foster. Um, Ali Abdelaziz um, says that uh, when I talked to him that night, they're looking at the first quarter of next year. 
Uh, one, do you have a more solid date than that? And two, where are you guys at in your timeline with Brian Foster? Does it not even start until the next next year? Oh yeah, we're we're, we're he, uh, just in case he stays in the gym. You know, uh, uh, we're always focusing on new techniques when he's not training for a fight. And it uh, looks like they, they told us, uh, like, the beginning of April, which is rough for us because that puts us on the shelf for a long period of time. And, uh, but what are you going to do? So we kind of go with the date that they give us. But, uh, man, Brian Potter, he's a great fighter. He's going to bring action. So it's going to be a fun one for the, for the crowd. And, uh, you know, he's got great spirit. I mean, you see he lost to the guy that he won in the finals. He lost in the first minute and came back and won. So that, that speaks hot. That speaks uh, a lot about his, his mindset, you know able to overcome those and uh, you know when it comes to a champion you've got to know that if you lose the first round you still can win the fight and then also if you lose the fight you still can be a champion so he's got that mindset and uh, it's going to be really fun to face another guy who comes in with that mindset and uh, ready to go you know head to head with Gaethje but I think a lot of people look at Gaethje and he looks very uh, he looks very basic and, and, and fundamental and you feel like you can expose a lot of things to him but there's a, there's a lot of things that Gaethje hasn't even shown yet you know because he just loves the fight He's definitely getting smarter with going, all right, I got to stop taking so many punches and, uh, and knowing that. But he's just a fan pleaser. He's a giver. He's all about giving fight, uh, the fans the fights they want to see. You know, and uh, but he's so damn technical. And when people, they always say, oh, man, I can go out there and deal with that. But once they feel how much leverage that he produces, it doesn't even look right. It doesn't even look, sometimes when he's throwing a punch, it looks like he's slapping with his right hand. But the way he's turning that knuckle over is a unique thing. You know, it's uh, something that works for him. And when it comes to his low kicks, I mean, everybody says they can they can check his low kick and take his low kick. But once they once they feel the weight and the technique and the way he positions his shin, uh, it's it's one of a kind, man. His his low kicks are, you know, they they, they hurt. Yeah, and absolutely, and, and I, you know, it's, it's I'm I'm sort of w- w- wearing out the analogy now, but I, I've said it a thousand times. Justin Gaethje is the Atoro Gotti of MMA for me, and I think that he gets in there and he puts you in his world and even though you think he's yeah. hittable you're like okay let's 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 take I, he's hittable so I'll, I'll stand with him and i'll get in that range it's exactly yeah. where he wants you so even though you yeah, think he's brilliant. hittable he's like i'm gonna get to my shot before you'll get to yours and let's just yeah. see how it happens and, and, and yeah i mean obviously i just think that people are missing the fact that you're not a world champion at a major promotion at that age without something being special and just because he takes some shots doesn't take that away yeah completely and he's also like like again when it comes to a uh, 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 fighting, it's uh, yeah. I always say it's like a dance. There always has to be a lead in a dance. When it comes to dancing, the man's always the, the lead. When it comes to a dance, and when it comes to fighting, it's the same thing. You need to ha- you need to be in control of making the fighter fight your fight. And as you've seen with Rose, we were able to uh, have Paige fight our fight, which you know was able to, to we're able to con- con- control our mindset because they're, we're, they're doing everything that we want them to do. And that's what Gaethje is the best at. Gaethje is so darn good at making you fight his fight. And once you do that, I mean, he's the, he's a the guy that says, hey, man, I, I, I know I can die in the ring, and if anybody kills me, it's going to be me from, 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 uh, uh, from you know, pushing my fitness levels past the point. You know, so he's, he's a guy who is, is so darn strong mentally, and uh, there's no break in that guy. I mean, he's going to be in your face and really make you fight the fight of your your life when it comes to to that to that raising that heart rate and, and really being in a storm. Yeah, and it's like it's like you said, a guy you also have a little bit of history with, or a lot of history with, Rashad Evans. Saw him one time talking to Roy Jones, and Roy Jones was like, you know, you have to go in there and say, I'm I'm the one that's we're on my clock tonight. You know, yeah. I'm the one that we're, we're we're dancing to the music that I'm playing, and that's what Justin yep. does. Whatever what, for whatever yep. else people say, that's what Justin does. Um, Completely. And then real quick. I don't want to, you know, kind of get you in any trouble or, or, or start something that's not there. You guys feeling good at World Series of Fighting? Are you, I mean, wh- where's your relationship? Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, they, they, they've been great to us. It's, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure being with World Series. I, I've, I've been with lots of different promotions. And they, they've treated us great from day one. You know, but we're always a, a type of person too that we we know that we have to earn our way, and uh, you know, I, I I know this is a this is a this is a business. You know, whether you're working for Dana White or or Ali or who whatever promotion it comes to, the main thing is uh, uh, we we know that we're employed by them, and we got to go out there and, and and do what's asked of. And we're never going to say, hey, we, we're not going to fight this person, this person. We're not in control of that. So once you get to the bigger shows, you have to be okay with that, and you know, doing what is asked and doing more than what to ask for. It's easy to say, hey, I want to race, you know, and, and when you do stuff like that, it's the, it's the, the, 
the issues that I think a lot of people cause with things is they, they expect, they expect, and then they start to bitch and talk bad about someone, and that's not going to help you get to the right path. So just from my experience of, of just treating them like I wanted to be treated, and, and I know Justin does the same thing. I mean, it's, it's, they, they've been great to us. Awesome. All right, I'll, let you, I'll give you the final word. Tell me what's exciting over at Grudge and what you guys got coming up. Oh, man, there's so much exciting stuff. I mean, we, we have uh, that Brandon Gertz in uh, uh, Bellator who, who beat Melvin and then just beat Campos, who he had, he had lost to Campos last time they fought. And for him to go out there and stop him in the first minute of the fight was, was awesome, which is such an explosive uh, uh, combination. And, I mean, we just we got so much stuff going on right there right now. I mean, there's too many guys to talk about it. I hate the name guys because I always feel like I forget them. But uh, we're excited for Nate Marquardt's fight next week. That's going to be on Saturday against C.B. Dalloway. So I'm very excited to get him back out in, uh, in front of the, the fans and, uh, and, and and show that he's not past that time. Because I'm the first person to jump in and say, hey, man, it's, uh, is, it, is it his time? Has he had too many fights? But in the gym, he's performing so well. And I really felt like the altitude uh, – played a big part in the Mexico performance. So that'll be a fun one. That's next Saturday. All right. And and one last thing, I just want to take my hat off to you because I believe it was Nate Marquardt. Was it it Nate Marquardt that you uh, stopped the fight for? Yeah, yeah. That was in Mexico when you could just tell he wasn't performing. His body wasn't doing well. His posture and his body didn't look right. And, uh, yeah, it was was rough because I tried to stop the fight during the second round, but uh, they told me only the doctor or the ref could stop it, which I think that was crazy. Right. And, well, listen, I, I got to take it off to you. I mean, it, it shows you can see when you speak to you and you can see when uh, in, in the way you carry yourself that it's you're, it's more than just you're the coaches of these fighters. You really care about them and you're, and you're out for what's best for them. And, and uh, that's admirable in a sport that doesn't always have that. So uh, let me take my hat oh, off to you for the, that. It's the most important part, man. Boxing changed my life and I was on the streets and I, I, I have to get back to a sport that I love. And without the, with, without the fighter, there's not a fight, and a lot of people look at that wrong. I mean, there's so many times. I mean, there's no promoter without a fighter. There's, there's, there's no, no fight without the fighter. There's no manager. There's no trainer. So again, it's always about the athlete. And that's, this is the part that I get so inspired by. I mean, these guys go out there and lay it on the lines for us. And the, the hardest part for me, and I always talk to every fighter about it, is these guys have the toughest jobs in the world. Yeah, when you're when you're on top of the world, you're great, and everybody's like, oh man, they they live that that limelight lifestyle. But it's not like that. I mean, if you look at Ronda Rousey, how she, you know, the, you know, every every kid is, every little girl is dressing like her is for Halloween. But she goes out there and 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 gets beat with footwork against Holly Holm, and 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 she's doing everything possible in her mindset to win. I mean, she's walking through just damaging shots, and she loses and gets stopped, and just the the negativity that comes back. I, you know, I always have that talk with the fighter that, hey man, when you're on top, everybody knows you, everybody loves you, everybody's gonna be your best friend. But once that one fight happens you really find out who your true friends are and people act like they don't know you and it's a it's a tough tough sport seeing Aldo after that 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 loss last night it's a it's a humbling thing and uh you know i just tip my hat to every fighter who even gets in there and spars in the gym you guys all inspire me and man i'm i, I do this because i love the athletes and yeah that's the thing that, that a lot of people forget i mean when you're as emotionally invested as a coach as you are not everybody's yeah. just engaging you know, Justin Gaethje's yeah. undefeated. He's a champion. It's 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 a lot of fun times with Justin Gaethje. But you're just as emotionally yeah. invested in the guys that aren't making it happen or having issues, yeah. not getting paid right. Completely. It's a, it's a tough emotional uh, thing to go through, and, and you do a great job at it. All right, Coach, I'll, I'll let that. you go. I appreciate your time again, fans. This was Trevor Whitman. Um, lastly, Coach, just tell tell fans where they can follow you on Twitter and where you can uh, and where they can get information about Grudge. Uh, you know, I'm uh, Trevor Whitman, uh, at Trevor Whitman on Twitter, and then Trevor Whitman on uh, on Facebook and GrudgeTrainingCenter.com. And uh, come check us out. If you're ever in town, Colorado, you want to watch Sparring, feel free to come in. We always have open Sparring. All right, Coach, I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. We'll talk again soon. Yeah, thank you, buddy. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.